Well, good evening. It's good to be with you tonight as we open up God's Word. We are steadily working through Revelation. Can you believe we are in Revelation chapter 16? Working our way steadily through hearing what the Lord said to the church then, but to the church now. And so we're going to get right to work tonight. We're going to read the entire chapter. So if you have your Bible, please uh, feel free to open up. The words will also be on the screen. We're going to turn our attention now to the reading of God's Word. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The second angel poured out its bowl into the sea and it became like the blood of a corpse and everything died that was in the sea. The third angel poured out its bowl into the rivers and the springs of water and they became blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, Just are you, O Holy One, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments. For they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun. It was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. They did not repent of their deeds. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the, on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays away, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed." And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Verse 17. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there are flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake, such as there had ever, never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away and no mountains were to be found. And great hailstones, about 100 pounds each, fell from heaven on people. They cursed God for the plague of the hail because the plague was so severe. This is the word of the Lord given for his church. It's given for our good. Let's pray this evening. Father, as we consider Revelation chapter 16 tonight, we ask that you might encourage us with the great uh, triumph of Jesus Christ over this entire world, the triumph now and the triumph that is to come on that great day. Lord, for those who feel downcast and discouraged in reading something like this and think, how on earth can a loving God be like this? Oh Lord, would you give us a glimpse tonight of your holy anger that is together with your divine love and how they work perfectly together in your nature. How you're not a God who's turned a blind eye to the sin of this world, but Lord, in holiness and justice, you will make all things new. Help us, we pray tonight. In Christ's name, amen. I'm not sure if anyone here has heard of the name Catherine Rollins. 2015, London, England, well, in, in 2015, you can read the article for yourself. There's many uh, news stories throughout London written about her, but she discovered that her favorite flower vase in her living room, which she had used as a coffee table uh, ornament for about 30 years, was in fact an unexploded bombshell dropped by a German Zeppelin during World War I. When she was 15, apparently, she dug it up in a schoolyard with some of her friends, and ever since, she'd been unscrewing the conical cap on it and filling it with water, and there in the middle of her living room sat this, explos- uh, this explosive, uh, uh, th- this bomb that had not exploded yet, and it would sit on her mantelpiece with flowers sticking out of the top of it. 
And at one point of the interview that I had listened to, she had said that it actually had become part of her family. <laughs> well, one day after watching a television show about the exploding cases that had happened throughout the world, she began to worry about her shell-turned vase. And a quick call to the police, and sure enough, she was told that for the past 30 years, she had been sitting next to a bomb capable enough to explode and to kill people within a 20-meter radius, 30 years on her living room table. You see, it's possible to live in, in close proximity to devastating danger and just not know it sometimes. Never realize how precarious your situation is or how close to destruction you've actually come. And for Catherine Rollins, it wasn't until that TV documentary where her eyes opened up, she saw the danger that was right before her uh, on that mantelpiece, and she began to take action. Of course, any of us would, anybody in our right minds. Well, in many ways, the book of Rebel Revelation aims to do the same thing for you and for me. It's intended to open up our eyes to the danger of sin, to the judgment of sin in this world that we so easily become inoculated to, we so easily fall asleep to, we so easily forget that there is a destruction of sin and judgment from the God of the Bible. And the truth is, and the truth that I would like to propose to you and to me tonight, is that sin is like an unexploded bombshell that is waiting to go off in our hands. Now chapters 15 and 16 in the book of Revelation in particular aim to help us understand this danger, understand the judgment of God, understand how everything is going to unfold at the end of the day when judgment is brought upon the earth. And last week, precisely as Wadia had read the sermon, we saw the great source of judgment, the origin of judgment that flowed from the voice of God from the very throne room itself with presence and power and justice. Let me read one of the verses just to rejig our minds of the justice of the Lord, of the song that was sung in the throne room. Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? You alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. You see, I believe, for Christians and non-Christians alike, there is a temptation in our day to suggest that such dreadful plagues as we see here afflicting the world cannot possibly be sourced in God. God would not do something like this. God surely has nothing to do with them. Our God is a God of love. And well, so he is, but the love with which he gives this world and the love that is within his character is a righteous love. A love that is compatible with a holy justice and divine wrath. You see, we have a hard time understanding it because our anger is so rooted in selfish passion, isn't it? That we can't even comprehend the perfect love and justice of God. Well, I want to consider these judgment, judgments tonight in three uh, hopefully concise ways. We won't be able to go into all the details, but I want to look at the aim of God's judgment. I want to look at the use of God's judgment and finally the completion of his judgment tonight as we look at chapter 16, the, the aim, the use, and finally the completion of God's judgment. Very plainly, we see the aim of God's judgment seems to be in verse 10. There's a few other places, what we'll begin there, where it says the bowl of God's judgment is poured out on the throne of the beast and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. Wonderful, just picturesque language in the book of Revelation. It's utter alienation. It's separation from the Creator, like walking in a dark fog when you can't see two feet in front of your face. Confusion and terror set in because life is now in impenetrable darkness. But here's what I find striking about this passage as I read it m uh, multiple times over these past few weeks is that the people who are experiencing this alienation and this darkness, they don't seem to connect the dots, to connect that their affliction and terror with, is with their sin. In fact, the response is not one of repentance, not one of recognizing the holy divine wrath of God, but what is their response? They curse his name. They blaspheme it. They do not repent and give him glory. In verse 16, it goes on. It says they don't repent of their deeds. 
You see, the afflictions of the ungodly are designed to be a wake-up call, like Rollins with an unexploded bomb in her living room table. And, and then finally seeing the documentary, she saw the imminent danger that she had been in for 30 years. It's meant to wake this world from their slumber and from their sin and from their lack of repentance. Could it be that God is at work in the trials of this world to wake up those from their sin and slumber and from the, from the deadly... Uh, from the dead that is ultimately at the end? Could God be speaking through the unimaginable pain in our world, through all the things that we see in creation unraveling itself, calling you and me and others to repentance? Not to curse the name of the God, but to recognize his, his beauty, his holiness, his justice. Could it not be to wake up this world? Now, this means I believe at least two things. At least there's probably more. One of the scriptures in the New Testament that is frequently read is that the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but he's patient, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Judgment is coming. There is a day of great and final judgment where the wheat and the chaff will finally be divided, but that day is not yet. Today is the day to answer the call of repentance and faith. And so the second thing means this. If the call of invitation and repentance stands, it means for us here that before the final day dawns and ultimate judgment descends, that you and me, those who confess the name of Jesus Christ, that we need to go into all the world and to make disciples of all men and women, to call men and women, boys and girls, to repentance Of course, in this city, many will not repent. Many will curse the name of of God. They will not turn from their wicked deeds. But God has a people for himself in this city. However large or small, we don't know. This is left to God. But it's time for us to rise from our often comfortable and complacent lives, to go across the street, to go to the places the Lord has called us to be in the most humble, gentle respectful way and tell people that there is a God that they are accountable to, that there is a God in heaven who sent his son to die for their sins and there is no greater joy in coming to this God. There is no way to escape the judgment of God but to be found and to be hidden in Jesus Christ. Oh, I know the the cowardice feeling that you feel at times because I feel it too. I know the lack of courage that we can feel, not wanting to seem that we're unsophisticated in our faith or all the myriad of things that come our way. But if this judgment is real and this aim is to wake a world up from their slumbering sin, then you and I are part of this great plan through word and deed to exclaim the excellencies of Jesus Christ, that they may turn in repentance. That's why I want to settle with the aim of judgment. But as we move on, there is a use, and we see this through verses 12 through to 16. The sixth angel begins to pour out his bowl this time on the great river Euphrates. It's a picture of water drying up, making a path for the kings of the east. Commentaries, no shortage of ink spilled on these passages here. What does this mean? The sixth bowl actually mirrors the sixth trumpet that sounded back in chapter 10, verse 14. In chapter 10, there's a great army from across the Euphrates, and it's summoned to come and fight. One of the great fears of the Roman Empire, remember, was an invasion from across its eastern border from across the the Euphrates River. It's a picture of military conflict. The people of this day, thousands of years ago, they would have had in mind, we know what John here is speaking about. But this message continues to reappear throughout the book of Revelation, meaning them, but also for a time of great battle when the Lord will come at the time of great consummation. In verse 13, we're told that there is a counterfeit trinity. It's a dragon and two beasts, and they spew these demonic spirits from their mouths. Quite this incredible language that go out to deceive the rulers of the world, provoking them to assemble for battle. Now, verse 16 says they all gather in one place, and in Hebrew it's called Armageddon. It's translated, transliterated as Har Megiddo, which means the mountain of Megiddo. Has anybody heard of that? I'm going to share a few words about it. There is a place in scripture called Megiddo where the army of Judah fought against the armies of Egypt and they lost. But it's no mountain, it's a plain. And John, once again, he's using this as symbolic imagery for military invasion. 
And his point in telling us in these verses here is that just like Judah's battle with Egypt in the valley long ago, the world again in their myriad of ways will try to destroy the church before the end of the age. They will seek to deceive the church. They will seek to bring the church low in all of their feeble attempts. Satan himself, the first beast, state powers, the second beast, seeking to deceive the church, all provoke the world to turn on the church, seeking once and for all to defeat the people of God. Only this time, Armageddon is not fought. Armageddon doesn't happen. However, we see the mighty armies that come against the Lord and his people, that Jesus has great triumph over them as we see him showing up at the end of the age, that there is no battle too great for the Lord's people and for his church. He ultimately conquers. But I want you to look at something. Look at verse 15. The surrounding verses depict the world in rebellion against God, swirling in a mad rush to batter down the doors of the church. And in the midst of this great storm against the church, a voice speaks out to it. And Jesus says, Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may go about, not go about naked and be seen exposed. The battle lines are being drawn. Nations are seeking to quench the Lord's people. New orthodoxies of political discourse are spreading across the Western world in uh, incredible ways. The nations being deceived and great hostility being provoked against the church. And yet there's this call to response for the Christian. What should your stance be? How should you respond in the midst of this? And it seems to me here in verse 15 that we are to be ready and prepared, waiting for our bridegroom. Not exposed in our nakedness and shame, but clothed, alert, sober-minded in prayer, knowing that no one knows the day or the hour. But we are to keep watch. We are to, to remain alive. Our confidence rests in him, after all. Our hope rests in the Lord. These, bowl, these bowls warn us to stay alert for the coming of Christ. May I ask you today, have you been asleep when Christ has called you to watch and to pray? Have you fallen into temptation? Have you fallen into slumber? Maybe today the temptation is to be paralyzed with the uncertainty and doubt at all the collapse that is happening around our world. And the admonishment that I want to offer to you this evening is to wait for the Lord as the, wa as the watchman waits for the sun to rise at each dawning day. How much more assurance do we have that the Lord will return to make all things new? Psalm 130 says this, Remember, O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is steadfast love and plentiful redemption. When the dawn of our Savior returns, the battle will be over and all will be made new. And the call for you and for me, the call for the church is to stay ready, to stay prepared, to be like watchmen on the wall, not falling into temptation, but continually placing our hope in the Lord. Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake. So we see the aim of judgment. We see the use. Let me conclude tonight by thinking about the completion of judgment found in verses 17 through 21. It says this, the seventh angel pours out his bowl into the air and the signs of the final cataclysm appear, don't they? Flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, a great earthquake. The great city Babylon is torn in three and, and, and it itself collapses. God makes it drink the wine of the fury of his wrath. This is difficult, hard, sobering language. It says the islands fall, the, melt, the mountains melt, Hail strikes the world, and still notice the people still curse God as he destroys the world, as, as this world comes to an end. It's this awesome, awful, terrifying scene. But hear this. At the foundation of it all stands the cry of Christ the King, saying, it is done. It is done. The final judgment has last arrived. History is done. Time to repent is done evangelism and mission are done. The suffering of the church is done. The apparent free reign of evil and wickedness in this world are done. The malice of Satan, the attraction of sin are done. It's finished forever, once and for all. Now, of course, Jesus said these words, it is done, if you remember, while he was on the cross, 
when he took the sin and the wrath of God upon himself and he said these words, it is finished. The curse of sin, the wrath of God was taken upon himself at the cross of Jesus. He was judged in our place and the fury of the wine of God's wrath was given to him to drink and he drank it to the bottom for you and for me that we may never face that fury of God's wrath in this life and in the next. You see, the condemnation because of what Christ has done at the cross and claiming that it is done, that it is finished, means that the condemnation of the law is finished, that there is no condemnation ever for those who are in Christ Jesus. The wrath of God against believing sinners is finished. And so if I could conclude with these words today, the great news of Being a Christian, the great news of the gospel, believing that Jesus Christ has taken our sin upon himself, means that it's our only hope, that judgment has already been done for you, that justice has already been satisfied for you, sin has already been paid for in full in your case. And so that one day when we hear the words of Christ saying, it is done, it will not strike fear or terror into your heart. You will not hear the curse of God upon his lips, but instead a song of praise, a song of joy, because it will, it will bring about the mark of the end of sorrow and pain forever. I know some of us are discouraged in this room. This world can be a brutal and dark place. But we are to look to the horizon where the day of dawn will one day soon rise. And so today we press on, we pray on, we go forth courageously because Jesus wins at the end of the day. Jesus has triumphed. Revelation chapter 16 shows us the aim, the use, and finally the completion of judgment that says for everybody who is in Christ, your life is hidden in him. There's a security and safety that is found nowhere else. And so run to him this evening. Let's pray. Father, might you by your spirit increase our faith this evening. Cause us to trust more deeply in the finished work of the cross. How the only thing that we contribute to our salvation is our misery and sin and folly and fallenness. And you give us a righteousness that is not of our own. That one day we'll stand before you as unblemished people, Lord. That you would say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Perfectly righteous, not in our own works, but because of what Christ has done. I pray that that might encourage us tonight as we go about our weeks, that we might find ourselves in the triumph of Jesus and what he's done. We pray this in your name. Amen.